Hello and welcome to the Churros E Tacticas podcast. <laughs> uh, I just uh, the the last R there kind of made me choke up a little. Something happened to the back of my throat. <laughs> but uh, we're here. I, uh, I I I forgot I was doing the intro today. I was prepared that Diego was going to do it, and that's because. I forgot that Barcelona have a game in hand, and that's why we are technically second place. Um, a marginal second place because if Barcelona win that game in hand, they go ahead for the time being, even though we are equal on points. Although once the second Clásico comes around, um, that may change based on the head-to-head rule. Now that that's clarified by our patrons who who informed us of the rule on Friday. So Diego is here. He has a lot to be excited for because Los Jóvenes just <laughs> annihilated Alaves on the weekend. And on the flip side, Real Madrid's uh, sen- senior senior side, in, in led by Luka Modric and Toni Kroos, were fantastic against Valencia. So, um, Diego Lorin is here. Diego, how you doing? What's up, boy? That, that, that sounded like a, a very sort of mid-season, not very convinced or enthusiastic churros. That was like the, the hump day of the, of the podcast this season. <laughs> that was the hump day. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, technically you're the one that had to step up to do the intro. And again, thank you to our listeners, our patrons for clarifying to us exactly why, um, you know, the head to head in this case uh, or, or when it goes into effect and, and why Madrid last time with the Churros y Tacticas, last time we recorded, uh, were up. So um, you're right. I have a lot to ex- be excited about and a lot to be excited for. First of all, before we get into the football business, uh, quick announcement, more announcement, more something I wanted to g- share with you, Kian, and our listeners, seeing as, uh, you know, well, they're just uh, a fly on the wall, uh, privy to our conversations that we have twice a week. Um, dude, I got to commentate my first basketball match last night. What? And Yes, 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 yes. That's huge. So, uh, yeah, I know. Um, so, Barca TV Plus, uh, the platform is going to start emitting um, not all of the basketball matches in English, but the important ones. And, of course, uh, yesterday was the Copa del Rey final uh, between Barca and Madrid. And uh, I got to, uh, yeah, to my very first uh, uh, basketball commentating which was pretty nerve-wracking, and, and I have my voice back <clears throat> for, for a good part, for most part at the moment. Yesterday was half gone, and um, but still, what an experience. And of course, to be able to do that, on uh, to be able to make my debut uh, as a basketball commentator, doing a final, a Clásico for that matter, in the Copa del Rey, where Barca beat Madrid to a pulp, I mean, that's... The only that's the nice way of putting it anyway. Um, was really quite special, man. So um, yeah, I don't know if any listeners are subscribed to the platform to Barca TV Plus. If so, uh, give it a listen. Give me your honest feedback because I know I have tons to improve on. It was it was pretty nerve wracking. It was quite last minute as well when I got notified of the opportunity to actually commentate the game. Uh, it was all me by myself, which is pretty uh, um, I guess uh, intimidating as well. I would put it. But uh, but yeah, I hope to do many more games, and and I was it was a, it was a thrill, it was a joy. Um, I'm actually curious. I I really I don't watch European basketball. What is it like? Like what is it like compared to? to I, I don't know. Like what's yeah. the experience like? I didn't watch yeah. it. Obviously, I saw the score of that because it was all over uh, Twitter and the news that Barca obviously beat Real Madrid in in the Copa, which obviously is not doesn't matter. Talk to me when you have ten Euro League titles. But what's what's it like? Yeah, it was. Look, man, it was it was uh, it was exciting. It's. I gotta be honest. I don't watch Euroleague or European basketball very much. Neither. I like to watch the international game when it's like the Olympics or when it's the World Cup or you know the the, the Euro Cup and things in basketball. Uh, I get very much into that. But uh, on a regular basis, I don't focus so much on the NBA because or, I mean uh, on on European basketball because I you know any free time that I have besides watching football, I like to watch NBA games. Um, so, but I have had a little bit of experience watching it. And, and, and overall, what I would say is that in Europe, it's much more of a team game. Um, I feel that, you know, the, the, obviously it goes without saying that the best players in the world play in the NBA, that the talent there is second to none and just on a whole, on a level, a whole other level, excuse me. But uh, in Europe, the, yeah, the game is much more um, 
evolved around the team. Uh, you know, the, the defense as well. I mean, t- uh, defense is taken very serious. I think defensively, you know, uh, the NBA, if anything, could could learn a thing or two from from the European game. I th- you know, especially nowadays. I, I, I'm not gonna you know knock the the teams in the 80s and the 90s in the NBA where where defense was actually still a thing and defense would win championships, right? But uh, and and this is of course with the exception of, of, of certain teams and and you know I mean like like the Raptors of course your Raptors were were renowned for a team for 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 playing excellent defense that that got them the chip uh, last year uh, two years ago excuse me two seasons ago but uh, in general I would say you know the NBA kind of lacks when it comes to uh, defensive intensity and it's much more focused on individual stars scoring you know the, the big two or the big three scoring just silly amounts of points and and, and therefore uh, yeah, being the big standouts and the winning team eventually whereas uh, here it's it's again it's the, the 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 team everybody is is you know plays a key role the, the players the bench players know their role as well and um, it's it's also an enjoyable watch it's different there's 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 less highlights you know there's not as many spectacular dunks and things but it's intense and uh, I actually yeah I, I seriously enjoyed it I, I had a I had a, I had a thrill commentating it and watching it. What? Who do you think would win in like an all-time Real Madrid versus Barcelona starting five? Do we know enough about? We, I mean, we would have. Yeah, I would have to really kind of. No, I, that, that's a good one though. I would love to, you know, uh, go through uh, the history books as well and, and take a good look at uh, players from the past. Obviously, Pau Gasol, uh, Navarro, La Bomba, who, who recently retired uh, a few seasons ago. I mean. Paris has had fantastic players. Madrid has had incredible players. It would be, you know, it would be worthy of, uh, 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 say, a Friday or, 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 or an international break podcast or something for us to really dig deep into this because it would be interesting. I put together a quick starting five for both teams. It's kind All of right. half-ass. I don't know how the basketball, European basketball experts could correct us. Uh-huh. For Real Madrid, I have um, Doncic. Uh-huh. Rudy Fernandez, Nocioni, Serge Ibaka, and Arvidas Sabonis. For Barca, I have Ricky Rubio, Ersan Ilyasova, Nikola Mirotic, and the Gasol brothers down low. Uh huh. Uh huh. I'd watch Navarro that. In there? What's that? Navarro. I don't know who to start him over. Is he is he a big guy? No, no, no. He's the the, the point guard. I mean, he, he's he's the must starter. He's he's an okay. Maybe legend. maybe Rubio Navarro backcourt then. Right. 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 I'd watch that. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah. Let's uh let's talk about football. Okay. So I again I had uh I really thought that you were doing the intro. I wasn't prepared for it. Not not right. to say that I yeah, can't do it. Part. I can pull off the intro um on the spot. That's cool. But I definitely <laughs> wasn't expecting to do it. Um I thought your your win was slightly more impressive. Um because sure. I actually I just think Valencia were really bad, and I don't want to take credit yeah. away from Real Madrid, um, who played really, really well, and there are, there are things to get excited about. What we're excited about is slightly different than what you're excited about. What we're excited about is that, you know, Moritz and Cruz are playing incredible football uh, at their, quote-unquote, advanced ages. Moritz, obviously, much more advanced than Cruz, who is still relatively young. Whereas, on the flip side, you guys are you guys are just trounced Alaves, and the goals were incredible. And it was a good overall performance. So I just I was thinking about you during this Barca game and obviously after it. And I was thinking about, you know, how far the narrative has shifted since the beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. And Dembele has been talking about, you know, after the game, the unity yeah. and what Kuman has done. And it mm-hmm. just seems like the vibes are good right now. Maybe that'll change yeah. if Mbappe just tears you into 500 pieces. And mm-hmm. um, so we'll... Uh, We'll happily digest that when that happens. That'll be yummy. But I, but for now, it's uh, it's good vibes. Um, and even yeah. Moriba, who obviously is going to be really criticized for that giveaway to Rioja, I thought was okay Rookie overall. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I thought it would have been unfair to single him out because it's like, but he's played how many minutes of football? That was his first set of minutes, wasn't it? In professional, that was his. That was his- his debut in the league, of course, he debuted with the first team against Cornell and the Copa del Rey, but that was mm-hmm. his second uh, game with the with the first team. Yeah. 
So I was just thinking of you during this game. So because I, well, I just assumed you, that you'd be happy because it was just young players and a lot of nice I was. passing sequences, which I know you love. So yeah. talk us through yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I look. I mean, I I, I was genu- genu- genuinely chuffed when uh, while I was watching this match. It was it was a joy. It was uh, you know we had good passing sequences. Uh, I mean, that's even somewhat of an understatement because. Uh, uh, what was it after in the in the post match? I realized that uh, the goal that Trincao scored. I think it was the 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 second goal. It was a minute and a half where all the Barça players managed to touch the ball thirty five times before Mingueza puts in a cross, which ends up at Elish Moribas's feet, of course, and him being generous and and just uh, generally very aware of the other players passes that ball to Trincao. Uh, to uh, to get the ball so like you said i mean i thought it was uh, the perfect match if you will ahead of such an important champions league clash against a team like psg there was uh, a plethora of youth on the team of course that's a topic that we discuss so often on this pod in recent times comparing uh, the madrid and barca squad uh, we had the likes of, of Elish, uh, Mingueza, obviously. Mingueza, in his case, he's become a regular. Uh, we had Ricky Puig starting as well, to my delight. Uh, Junior Firpo uh, as well. I mean, I, I kind of put him in that young category. He's, he's in his mid-20s. I think he's 24, not yet 25 yet. Uh, Trincao, naturally, as well. So uh, a whole bunch of youth <clears throat> able to rest uh, uh, the, 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 the usual suspects, give them... Uh, give their legs a little bit more of a rest. And, um, uh, of course, I mean, Kuman was forced to uh, play many of these players as well because of the injuries. And then, uh, you know, I'm sure we're going to discuss that as well because Casimiro is down as, uh, again. So this is something that has been uh, a plague that has really been haunting not just Barca, not just Madrid, but but so many teams in La Liga and, and uh, you know, football around the world. But... Um, to get back to the game, I mean, Messi, you know, I think at this point we can say that Messi, this is Messi's best so far this season. Uh, his golazo from outside of the uh, – two golazos from outside of the box, uh, the one that hits both posts and the other one that just completely leaves uh, Pacheco stunned, a top goalkeeper. The likes of Pacheco, you know, was stopped at his feet in that second goal where – he just couldn't even move, um, given the pace of uh, of that shot. Uh, Trincao, you know, with a plethora of chances, so many chances and and, and goals as well. Two goals uh, that went in for the young Portuguese star. Uh, I thought the passing was just exceptional. I just mentioned the 35 touches leading up to that uh, goal, Trincao goal. But you know, Griezmann created chances. Uh, Busquets, Busquets had some fantastic passes over the top. Uh, Pedri, Messi, Ricky Butch as well. So all in all, just um, yeah, just you know, great sensations, great uh, the, the the perfect game to uh, to 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 that, that you know to lead, let's say, the troops into the big battle that is, of course, PSG. And and what's to expect from. Uh, from this game in, in, in the Camp Nou against uh, the team from Paris is yet to be seen. It, it'll be a very, you know, difficult challenge, a different challenge uh, for that matter than than uh, anything that Kuman has uh, had to deal with as of yet. And I guess that is the big worry, you know, because um, defense is an issue. Uh, individual errors are an issue. And we saw it in the Copa, I think, against Sevilla, which we discussed as well, it, 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 generally speaking, it was a very even matchup. Uh, um, but Sevilla's offense won mainly thanks to bad defense. And uh, so far against the big teams, your Sevilla's, Real Madrid, Atleticos, and so forth, um, Juventus included in the Champions League, Barca hasn't been able to set their mark and really you know, impose their style of play. So... Uh, I think that is the, the, the big challenge for Goleman is how this team will react against another team that enjoys having possession with, of the ball, that, that enjoys having the ball at their feet. Uh, because that's where I think the big problem and the big challenge will, will arise uh, on Tuesday. So just <clears throat> to bring that forward for one second, I, I, just to mm. focus on this Alaves game. Yes. Um, and yes, I agree. I, I think like obviously the PSG game is going to be the test. No, and no one will remember this Alaves game at PSG destroy you. But I, I think what was maybe scary about this Barcelona performance was that Alaves 
crumbled in the second half. They fell apart. I actually don't think they were that bad in the first half. And you look at Messi's two goals, um, one obviously in the second half and one in the first half, they were both, like, I don't care what the defense really does in that situation. Like, that, the fact that he's scoring from there is insane. And, yeah. like, so on the, on, the, on the second goal, which was, the, I mean, Barcelona's second goal, there's just like, I think at that point, Alaves had just started their crumble because in a weird way, I actually thought they, they prevented Barcelona from getting into the final third in the wings to start the game, which was surprising to me. And or I guess maybe pleasantly surprised from their perspective. And uh, and I was surprised that Mingesa and Firpo didn't provide many overloads to get into the final third. Maybe they were worried about the transition defense. And they actually... They actually put some good passes together the other way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, that then Lucas Perez shot <clears throat> in the eighth mm-hmm. minute was a golden chance that he should have mm-hmm. done way better. He just skies it over the bar. Uh, but there was a few other moments, I guess. Um, and they, they took space away from Trincao, I thought, really well. They closed central channels from Messi um, trying to go down the middle. But then something kind of, like, shifted I don't know what shifted, but they just they just started playing this really high line, which was exposed, and they weren't pressing either. It was just a mess, and it kind of unraveled for them. But just Barcelona's second goal, I thought it was it was just an insane goal, as we all saw, but it was so casually insane because Busquets just receives the ball deep, and then he like walks into playing this perfect line-breaking pass down the middle, like again, so casually, and just breaks Alaves, and then Messi just does that. It was just... Incredible, incredible goal. And and Busquets also had an amazing pass on the disallowed goal just before that yes. happened, yes. which was That's also amazing. Was that was over the before. top to Griezmann, right? So Correct. those were just kind of, I think it was like, you know, they obviously took advantage of Alavez not defending well. But even when Alavez were defending well, they they seemed in control. And again, I think that's what's scary about all this is that, you know, they had a high volume of chances. They could have actually scored a bunch of goals even though they scored five. Like, they were outside of those goals. There were there was one Trincao notable chance and one with Griezmann in the box. They just had high volume but high quality volume of chances right. in this game. And I think that was impressive. And again, we, all, we said at the beginning of the season, if Messi starts to start scoring again, and now he's not only scoring, but he's scoring goals that it just... 0. 0.03 on the XG chart for his first one and 0. 0.04 on the XG chart for his second one. He's scoring goals that nobody else can really score. So once you kind of start factoring that into it, and also I think some of the younger players like Mingesa are start, are like more comfortable now than they were when they initially broke out, I think. So mm-hmm. now they're getting integrated, although I don't know what it looks like if he plays right back against PSG. I think that'll be a big test for him. Yeah, yeah. Also, PK is back in training apparently. So do yeah, you, do you trust him in a game like this or do you think it's too soon? Well, that's a bit, that's a loaded one. Uh, I mean, that's for Kuman to decide. You know, he he's been practicing with the group for about four or five days. Kuman said today, um, I you know, he'll he, he Kuman. If if there's one thing that Kuman places importance on, it's match fitness. And if a player is called up, it's because he's 100 percent match fit. Now, obviously, in the in the case of Barca, the defenders. Uh, fitness is a touchy issue so whether he'll be forced to have him on the the call of sheet or not is a different question altogether but you know i trust him to (laughs) know the answer to your question a lot better than me so um you know it it's how long has he been out now it's uh what was it in october or something like that yeah it was supposed to be a three-month process wasn't it or is or is it Uh or is it three months since it's so I, i just read three months somewhere i don't know if that was what the diagnosis was, but he's also accelerated his return, right? Like he wasn't yes, supposed to be back yes, this exactly. early. Yeah. No, no. And those kind of things always worry me, especially at, uh, you know, the age that, that Gerard Piquet is at. So I don't know, man. I don't know. It's, um, I don't know. I, I just know that, you know, the defense and, and this is not rocket science. Uh, I'm certainly not telling anything to uh, Pochettino that he doesn't know already. But the defense is, you know, the Achilles heel certainly of this this Barca side that offensively I think has been is is clicking, um, you know, the, the, the better than than ever before so far this season. I'm referring to, 
but defensively still allows too much. You, you talked about uh, the Lucas Perez chance. Also, uh, Rioja had a had a fantastic chance. Of course, in fact, I mean the goal came from uh, Rioja as well. Um, so the Alaves did have their own chances uh, when the score was still two one, to um, or even uh, one nil to 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 you know tie the the the, the score line and, and get back into the game. Uh, but thanks to uh, Barca's potent offensive power, that that didn't happen. But against a team like PSG, you gotta, you know, you gotta be a slightly worried about that for sure, for sure. Um, what do you think happens if? Oh, hold on, let me rephrase this. Um, with Kuman having a better season now than obviously initially, initially. Um, was the case, which is, by the way, understandable because he inherited a bad team that lost 8-2 to Bayern Munich in the Champions semifinals and it was in turmoil, a lot of distractions outside of the field. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I think it's incredibly difficult to turn that around. Now he's starting to turn a corner a little bit and maybe winning back some fans now that he's playing pooch. Huh. If he ends the season on a really high note, do you think that, or, or wherever, whenever the elections come around, do you think that hurts Victor Font's case? To because, bring in Xavi, you mean? Because his whole thing is basically based around Xavi? Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he has, you know, said on record in public that uh, his initial um, statements were taken out of context and that in the case that Ronald Kuman does a satisfactory job, that uh, effectively Xavi Hernandez would be named sporting director instead of head coach. Uh, hmm. So, of course, they wouldn't, you know, um, move, push Kuman to the side if he ends up winning, you know, whatever trophy is, 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 is up for grabs. I think with the La Liga out of reach, uh, the Champions League and the Copa del Rey are left over. So the Copa del Rey is, 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 uh, has become now a, a mammoth task uh, to score two goals in, against a team that has only let it one goal in the past nine consecutive wins that they've had. And talking about uh, Lopetegui Sevilla, of course. So that's become very difficult. So there's only Champions League left to play for. If Kuman wins the Champions League, he will stay. Uh, I will go out on a limb and uh, say that right now. You know, given the um, teams that are still competing in the Champions League, uh, seeing as this is a Barca side with a whole bunch of frailties uh, and defensive weaknesses, I see that as unlikely to happen. Therefore, you know, I I, I don't know what Kuman like how Kuman will have to finish off the rest of the season um you know in order to to keep his job at the end of the at the end of the season and that's of course if Victor Font wins the elections if Laporta wins you know who knows I don't, I don't know yeah I think he's been a little bit less vocal about uh or a little bit less he's been much far less vocal with regards to the manager that he would like to see take over do we have any election updates at this point other than that, not so much. Oh, except for uh, tomorrow. No, tomorrow Wednesday. Wednesday, excuse me. Wednesday, there's a debate on Barça TV. Um, a debate between the presidential uh, candidates, all except for Joan Laporta. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, take that as you will. Uh, Joan Laporta has said. Uh, so he Laporta moved. himself <laughs> had didn't didn't want to partake. Yes, he okay. said. You know what? Um, I've you know th- there's three uh, uh, th- th- there's there's like three uh, official debates already scheduled. This fourth one for Barça TV was kind of uh, uh, an add-on, a plus, let's say. Um, and Laporta said, "Nah, I'm good." So it'll just be between Freixa and Victor Font. Does that hurt his case, or doesn't matter? <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, do people he's... actually use the debate? I guess they would, as like a yeah. Had yeah, to decide. I mean, of course, it's a great stage, you know, to, to put forward the plan. And then, I mean, Victor Font, if anything, has been so um, vocal about it and, 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 you know, has been doing his uh, 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 press conferences or, or I should say his uh, rounds to the media outlets to uh, discuss uh, his plans 
And uh, whereas, you know, with Laporta, there's there's still a whole bunch of question marks. Having said that, Laporta is the front runner and all the polls show that he is well ahead of his uh, rivals. So he's probably looking at that and going, you know what? Hmm. He's taking the Joe Biden approach, right? He's saying, I don't really need to talk that much. So I'll just kick it at home and let these dudes to duke it out. And then I'll, I'll do whatever. I'll do the minimum effort, let's say, whatever I have to do. Because he's he's well ahead in the in the polls right now. Please tell me you're moderating that debate. <laughs> I'm not. Ah, oh, shoot. <laughs> Too bad. Yeah. No, I will not. <laughs> well, my friend, at at this point, does it really matter what Real Madrid or Barcelona do? Because Atletico keep winning. And um, yeah, you know, it's funny because <clears throat> I don't know if anyone, but just in case they they did, but I don't know if anyone actually did, but just in case they did get their hopes up for. Atleti dropping two points against Celta. They're back. That even like the Celta game, like they made that adjustment at halftime, shifted back into a four four two, got control. They're also missing so many players, like in every part of the part of the yeah. team. Yeah. COVID injuries. Yeah. And they're yeah. just finding a way. And this this last game against Granada, they just it's again will. It's 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 the comeback yeah. spirit that Real Madrid and Barcelona have had in past years where they won the league. They have it this season. They have it. Um, yeah. Again, the five-point lead is with two games in hand. So, I, I don't know. Do we have any Atletico things? I, I just want to say that I was right about Marcos Llorente all along, but not in the way <laughs> I thought I would be right about him. I Just what he's doing offensively is remarkable. I think he has... Wasn't something absurd like 14 goals now in the season? And he also, he also leads the league in assists, I think. It's just insane what he's doing. So, um, and obviously Suarez. And 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 did you? I don't know if you clocked this. We retweeted it from the Churros account. Luis hmm. Suarez has 16 goals on 20 shots this season. 20 wow. shots. That's even wow. impressive. In like, a, if it's us, if like Shaq is getting the ball in the post and he scores 16 <laughs> points out of 20 shots, it's impressive. Oh, wow. Or 16 that times is, out of is... 20. Yeah, no, I got yeah. you. Thirty-two points, yeah. but uh, that's that's insane. That I, I did not know that. I mean, um, look, you know, we've been uh, us and and everybody for that matter, and, and their grandmamas have been talking uh, just maravillas, uh, marvels about uh, Llorente and and Correa for that matter. I think you know, on the day where Luis Suarez. Uh, wasn't able to put a goal in the back of the net after having uh, had, I believe, a string of four consecutive games where he got on the scoreboard. Um, you know, it has to be Llorente and uh, Correa who take over and, and take care of business. I thought Condogbia was uh, particularly good as well. Good passing from him uh, between the lines over the top to Suarez. Um, despite Suarez not scoring, I mean, he was fighting literally everything. I love seeing that Luis Suarez intensity that only he can bring <clears throat> out on the pitch when he uh, when he really wants to, right? Um, and uh, I mean, Granada t- tried really. This was this was a very uh, serious match uh, uh, from uh, the Andalusian team. I think until the what was it, fiftieth, fifty second minute, roughly, uh, they were still in it. Uh, had a possible penalty call as well, but um, pretty soon after, you know, Llorente, your boy, became the protagonist and uh, just showed everybody once again, you know, you can put him anywhere, whether it be as a winger, whether it be as a forward, whether it be as a midfielder, he is literally that good. And um, I mean, at this point, Kian, I know we did our midseason awards already, but but if we would have to come up with a top three uh, best players of La Liga, you know, I think he would make that cut. Uh, you talked about his goal scoring and his assist abilities. Whether he's leading an assist, I, I don't know that off the top of my head. It wouldn't surprise me, you know. And and I I think I would put him in that top three, because uh, along with Luis Suarez and, and and Messi, I think he deserves uh, to be in that top three spot. Uh, for me, Luis Suarez and, and Llorente are the driving force behind this uh, unstoppable Atletico that also have. Uh, uh, the previous uh, previously mentioned Correa in in just excellent form, um, you know. Okay, he got a lucky deflection on that uh, definitive two one, but uh, but but you know what a team, just a great pair as well between Correa and Llorente. Uh, the way they attack, the way they attack the space as well is 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 is, is, a, is a joy to watch, in particular for all of us that have been watching Atletico with so much 
you know, kind of despair, uh, seeing as they, uh, uh, could, you know, were always, uh, have been, uh, at least under the management of uh, Cholo Simeone, uh, La Liga giants with so much talent. But actually now that talent is uh, coming to fruition and uh, we're seeing them play some, some really good football. So, uh, you know, again, uh, sal- a salute, a salutation uh, from Churros y Tácticas to uh, the uh, La Liga champions. <laughs> well, because they're, they're unstoppable. They, uh, <clears throat> and just to confirm, because I said I wasn't sure entirely if, uh, like, I, 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 I was unsure if he was actually the assist leader, and he is. He has seven assists. He's first in the league. Second is Iago Aspas with six assists. Mm. Um, it's pretty, pretty incredible stuff. So, yeah, he's been fantastic. Uh, so I guess well, I, where I was right about him was that I always thought he was incredibly press resistant and he can contribute to the midfield and attack, but not to this extent. So I guess what he's basically done is he's taken that pre- press resistancy, but just taken that to the final third and taken it to a whole another level because he's getting out of tight spaces on the wing and then creating chances. Like that, the his signature move now is essentially... He picks someone's pocket in the final third. He goes on the wing, dribbles past one or two players, cuts this way, cuts that way. The defender has no idea where he's going, and then he cuts it back to an open player. And also, you know what's impressive about all this? They're really doing this without uh, an informed Zhao Felix, who has cooled right. off significantly since yep. the start of the season. They're all doing this through other yeah. um, means. And I'm sure... Zhao Felix himself will get back to a certain level and that that then this ceiling of this team will will get enhanced even further more so impressive yeah. stuff um I would love I mean of course this is all all hindsight and everything but I would just love to have seen um as you mentioned Madrid I, I want to discuss that game a little bit more as well if, if uh, we can a little later on but with the good form that Madrid showed against Valencia uh, Barca, of course, of, of late as well, uh, Sevilla and Atletico. If the season had started with these teams in this great form, you know what the table would look like. But um, and and again, I'm not taking any way anything away from Atletico. I just think that that now at this peak or, or crucial point, this crunch time point of uh, the league, you know uh, things are getting very inter- or could have been very interesting had Atletico not had such a. a Giant gap, of course, and, and leading the pack so far away from uh, the, the the followers. You mentioned Sevilla there. I just want to mention that Papa Gomez looks like he's been playing there for ten years. <laughs> he does. I swear to God, the guy's the OG. He's, he's <laughs> like he's the big dog in that locker room on day one. He just walked in there with his dick swinging and things, <laughs> like telling people how how to run, how how things are taking care of business, like how things are running in that locker room. I swear. I bet you uh, there's other players looking at him, like Luke De Jong, going, "Wait, aren't you a new guy? Should you be <laughs> <laughs> quiet and just observing things?" I just like you see something, man. Watching that Sevilla Huesca game, it was like he just took over. He just he did what he wanted yeah. to, and he was playing. He never settles for this easy cop out pass. He just constantly dribbling at people or or looking vertical putting these amazing passes into the box. He's a good dribbler. He's a great shooter. The one thing I think he could have done better, there was one break that they had in the second half where I think he should have passed it. Um, and he ended up kind of getting his shot blocked. But other than that, he to. was fantastic. Um, and He wants to get his goal. Man. He just he got integrated really quickly. And um, yeah. despite being taken off in the 75th minute, I mean, his influence was was all over the game. He had 64 touches. He had a couple of key passes. His passing accuracy was very high. I just he just did a lot of good work, and I think he's a tremendous fit at Sevilla. I just do. I wonder also, like, does this? It doesn't put Sevilla in contendership, but it certainly I feel like makes them a safer bet for that top four spot. Oh, for sure, man. Yeah. For sure, especially looking at, at, at you know Real Sociedad via Real at the moment. Um, Sevilla are un escalón por encima, like one step ahead of these guys. Um, and, you know, I don't know how big the margin is right now. If it's five, six, seven points um, along those lines, I think it's six or seven. I mean, they they have cemented themselves for that, you know, number four spot. And who's to say, you know, not third? Um, Barca are now in third. So I think we're only one point ahead of Sevilla. Uh, and anything can happen. 
course, in this uh, uh, crazy final stretch of the league. Um, I wanted to, to give a special mention to, uh, well, to two people, really. Munir, who only yes. scores golazos when he scores. He's been uh, good. was a fantastic header. But uh, also, <laughs> the man in the match for me was, uh, was Bono. Um, you know, what, what a great goalkeeper, man. Um, having said that, I, I thought that Fernandez for Huesca was, was particularly good as well. Um, you know, I, I had to go... To the, to the table to kind of see how many goals that they have uh, received as a team and it uh, wasn't entirely to my surprise to see that despite being uh, last in the uh, standings that there are actually six teams ahead of them who have received more goals than uh, them so shout out to, uh, to Fernandez of Huesca because uh, I think he's a fantastic goalkeeper but on the other side Bono man you know Many were surprised when uh, Sevilla signed him from Girona. Uh, but it's just another freaking solid Monchi move because uh, he's, he, he's just been fantastic. I, I thought, you know, there were moments there where Huesca should have and could have gotten a goal and it would have been totally deserved. Um, the, there was a, a Rafa Mir header that, that I remember him stopping. Then yep. shortly after, there was a double, sp- a, a double sp- uh, stop, excuse me, a little bit later. <laughs> And uh, again, I mean, I, I threw out the statistics earlier on. Nine consecutive wins and only one goal received uh, with all respects to uh, Kunde and company. A lot has to do, a lot of that has to do with Bono, who, uh, you know, for me is, is, uh, was a standout and has been a standout for this, this uh, Sevilla side. He had two on Rafa Mir. There was the header one that you, you spoke about, which Pablo Maffeo set him up. And then there was one... Uh, later, like towards the end of the game, from the six-yard box, which was point blank saved from from a shot. That was the double stop, right? Yeah, I think that was, was part of the double. Yeah, I think that was part of the double save where um, there was yeah there was two in that exact sequence. So, by the way, Montreal born baby, born in Canada. Uh-huh. Yeah, did you know that? No, I did not. Yeah. Okay. He go. left Canada us. I don't know who we who we chose. Who does who? What's his nationality now? Bono is, uh, isn't he, uh, I'm going to say Argentinian? Maybe. He is uh, Moroccan. Moroccan, Jesus Christ. Yeah. You were way off. off. My apologies. My apologies. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, born in Canada. <clears throat> I, I call him Bono. That's right. It's it's actually Bono. Yeah. Uh, Yassin Bono. My well, apologies. I think his jersey says Bono, though. That's that's it where does. the confusion is. It yeah. does. It does. He, 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 well, he's got the Canadian nationality. So, I mean, I don't know. Does he play for the Moroccan national uh, side? I, I don't think he plays for us, although I am the worst Canadian football fan ever. Um, so, I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure he doesn't play for Canada. I'm pretty sure. He, so, that means he must. Maybe because he's only broken out this season. Maybe. I don't know if he plays for Morocco yet. Hmm. Churros. <laughs> Let's just list up all the things we don't know that we're supposed to know. Totally right. Uh, days. Yeah, I, I, as far as I can tell, yeah, he has a bunch of appearances from Morocco. So there yeah, he's totally Moroccan. Okay. Good, good. Oh, so hey, but where where does this leave um, Sevilla Dortmund man? Halan against Kunde. Are you uh, looking forward to it? So Dortmund are a mess right now. Dortmund, yeah. and and then they have this whole thing with um, with uh, uh, Marco Rose of Muchen Gladbach now rep- is leaving them yeah, at the end I of the season. They're, he's going to Dortmund reportedly, uh, which I think is a great pickup for Dortmund. But this it's just they're in this weird place. They haven't improved since they've let go of Favre, and I'm really looking forward to that because Sevilla are looking really good right now, and. Yeah. Would I don't know if you would agree or disagree, but do you think you give Sevilla a higher chance now than you did like when the straw was made? Totally, man. Yeah. You have to. Absolutely. It's I mean it's a little bit like Barça PSG where you know what a difference uh, a month or two makes because um you know, I think in terms of Sevilla they're looking you know, just so so fresh, so so tight, so organized. Uh, a clear idea. Their defensive solidity is is is, is the best of La Liga at the moment, and um, uh, I think offensively, that's really where maybe Dortmund could can 
still outshine this team. Uh, but obviously, with the addition of Papu as well, you know, maybe I'm. You know, hopefully, they're gonna make me eat my words because um, everything seems to be clicking over for uh, Lopetegui's side, and 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 I'm happy for them. Uh, they're they're where I think we all want them to be. And uh, for me, looking over at uh, the troubles at Dortmund right now, you mentioned as well the. Uh, was it Munchen Gladbach making that official through a tweet uh, that uh, their coach will be departing for uh, for Dortmund at the end of the season? All these weird things we see. Haaland also getting into scuffles. Um, not the first time that we see that this season. So yeah, it's um, you know it, it's going to be an interesting battle, and uh, I think that Sevilla will get the upper hand. At least I I, I cross my fingers for them. We'll see. Um... Did you what what Real did stuff? Did you want to talk about if if anything? Uh, I wanted to talk about the easy victory, man. I mean, you know, <laughs> I hope that this is going to be a lesson for you that Valencia is is just no match for Madrid, man. This was except uh, for I that mean, time they won team. four four one in I know, November. Man, but, right. No, but well, to be to be fair, like you and I did the post game show for for the game yesterday. Yes, yesterday the game was. Um, and we were talking about like, or at least I mean, we were both talking about how bad Valencia were. But and I brought up the fact that like even in that four one, it was a deceiving four one. It was like mm. it was the hat trick of penalties from Carlos Soler, a bunch of defensive right. mistakes right. from Real Madrid, Sergio Ramos making a terrible mistake, just just bad defensive things happening. And right. it's not like right. Valencia were that good in that game either. And I don't not like Real Madrid were either. So I don't want to say that Real Madrid should have won that game or anything. But I just think Valencia. It certainly wasn't a 4-1 type game. And in this game, they literally, to me anyway, they just laid down. There was no fight. There was yeah, nothing. There not was no exactly. no offense, no defense, just this like traffic cones, traffic cones on the field. That's what it looked like. It was, I mean, if you're Paco Polit, shout out to Paco, you have to be very worried, you know, because this is one of those games that you think a team like Valencia has got circled on their calendar along with Barca and Atletico and the other La Liga bigs for them to make a statement, uh, you know, that, hey, we are where we are in the league standings and the season has been what it is. But, um, you know, we are Valencia we, we and we fight for our pride and especially against uh, these big sides where we think, you know, we should be amongst. I mean, if... With, you mentioned it. The key word, I think, attitude. I think attitude is half the battle for Valencia when uh, with the season that they're having. And um, they didn't show up. And, and, and if they don't show up for this kind of games, then when will they? You know, that is the worrying thing, for I think, for Valencia fans. When you've got somebody like uh, Mendy Mondi <laughs> given give the time and space to run back from an offside position to put in a goal. Thank God he was still offside because um, I don't know if you know the sequence or I'm talking about that offside goal by the smallest of margin, but I don't know what was happening with Valencia's defense in that moment, but he just was given all the time and day to you know be offside and then not be offside and be marginally offside uh, and luckily so because that goal would have just been you know the the cherry on top when it comes to embarrassment for Valencia and their performance on the night or on the day I should say it was in the afternoon uh, it was awful it was awful man um, you know how easy could it get for Real Madrid the, despite for example Benzema's goal I thought was was initially I thought was a great goal and, and, and I'm not taking anything away from the Frenchman but you know with Correa, I think it was. Uh, am I pronouncing it? Correa, I think. Yeah, Thierry Correa, yeah, right? Thierry Correa, yeah. The him, him basically uh, not moving, being completely static, <laughs> and Benzema, you know, just shifting to the side, and Paulista then turning his back as well to the ball. Uh, it doesn't get much easier for a team with so much firepower and talent like Madrid. Even Casimiro's shot, I thought, was badly saved by Jama Dominic. Um, that first half was just was just dreadful. It was awful. And <clears throat> we're talking about a Madrid side where you know Carvajal got injured uh, in the game as well. They've got, of course, their 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 own massive injury list and all the problems as well. And and Valencia just didn't seem to be even caring or willing to to capitalize on anything of it, on on any of it. And uh, that for me was was just a huge disappointment, really. The only thing they really did were three terrible 
no chance shot. Not not terrible. So because one of them Courtois actually had to make a brilliant save, but very very low percentage shots from outside the box throughout the course of mm. ninety minutes, right. and they they kind of barely threatened on a set piece, but not really in the eighty third minute. And there the xG was staggering low for this game. So it was zero at <laughs> halftime, and then by the end of it, point zero six. And I just thought it was remarkable that like. Again, I, I I don't know what else to say other than that it was just a very bizarrely, um, just unchallenged victory for Real Madrid. I, and again, I don't want to take away anything from Real Madrid who played really really well. And Cruz oh, had right. one of his best games, and he's had a great season. So to say to yes. say best game is saying a lot. I mean, he was fantastic. Yeah, I I just think like with Valencia, they're in this weird spot where you and I were talking about Dominic kind of when we we're talking about La Liga goalkeepers for our midseason awards. And that Dominic has faced the most shots in the league. And it's just weird because also Valencia have this defensive identity, but then all of a sudden they're giving up all these shots. Yeah. And, um, and Dominic can be so hit or miss with all those shots that he's faced. Like he's, yeah. he's sometimes great. He's sometimes bad. And there's, um, just a lot for them to deal with defensively. And I just see this even, even despite, despite, losing as many players as they have and what Peter Lim's done to that team, they still have enough mm. talent to be playing better than this. Yeah, like, Manu yeah, Vallejo is so. not a complete scrub. He's a talented player. Kevin Gamero is a proven La Liga striker. Maxi yeah. Gomez, too. Yo, Musa yeah. does stuff, like, off the bench. Um, Ratchet <laughs> can do stuff. Guedes, we all know what he can do. I just, like, they're too talented to be playing like this. So, yeah, yeah. and I, I don't no, want to go into um, blaming... Javi Gracia, obviously, he has he has blood on his hands, obviously, but I'm, but obviously, these are deeper issues that. Uh, I mean, listen, yeah. like uh, he himself said in a post match press conference, he said Madrid won easy as fuck, uh, and and uh, that's textually what he said. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm did he actually say that it. verbatim? <laughs> he did in English as well. Fantastic! It was amazing. So uh, he said it in words. English. Yes, those are his words, not mine. Why did he um, say it in English? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I'm so fascinated about the most little no. the little things because I've never heard anyone speak English in the, in a La Liga post game press conference unless no, it's somebody who can't speak Spanish. He said it just like that. He said Madrid won easy as fuck and dropped the mic and walked out. Uh, I somehow it was, missed this. Uh, it was quite something, quite something. But uh, listen, but be, listen before we wrap it up. Uh, Carvajal injury Zizou in the post-match said it's not only bad luck uh, for me that was kind of the standout phrase yeah. that kind of perked up my ears what's he referring to he's referring to bad habits bad preparation bad medical team bad planning bad, bad what if, if it's not bad luck what, what, I mean he's, is he firing shots here again or Zizou I think I think it was a subtle or not so subtle jab at somebody who hmm. Who, because so Zidane. One thing I'll say about him: he's generally good with this stuff. Like he's not, he's not one who will. I mean, look, he 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 plays the starters into the ground, yes, but he's also the type of person who constantly like takes advice from the medical team and actually predetermines rotations and predetermines substitutes. Whether it was saying he predetermined to take Vinicius off in the fifty-fifth minute, regardless. Uh, but then had to change it uh, against Getafe because Marvin got injured, or like knowing ahead of time on the schedule that this is the game where we're going to give Cristiano Ronaldo rest um, because that's a strategic thing we're doing. And he he certainly will Cristiano. take. This is a going back way. This is like this oh, is right, how it right, all okay. it all started. How Remember he convinced he Ronaldo rest. to rest. They would pre- predetermine oh, right, when right, he would right. rest. Yes, of course. Yeah, and he's yeah. talked about this over the past few years that like we're going to uh, predetermine rotations like ahead of time because we know kind of like the rhythm and the cycles and we, we take the advice of the medical team with Carvajal. Obviously he got the green light to come back. And I think this was, and by the way, I, I don't know if that exact quote was after the game or before the game, because he had a pre game press conference where he said injuries, are, the injuries are not bad luck, but with, mm. with Carvajal, it's a situation where he actually aggravated the, the, the same injury he had, Right. This is not a new injury where you can start saying it's bad luck. It's the same injury. Um, and I think that he was given the green light in this game 
obviously wasn't the correct call. Like now we have hindsight, but I'm sure like they have to know like there is a chance that this could have happened, right? And if they don't, that's worrying to me. So, and now with like all things, if there's a sh- possible short term game of him playing and playing well in a game like this, the you're paying the tax of it now. Like you're now you have to. He's out for like two three months, I think. And he's such an important wow. player. Um, so whatever it was, whether it was bad medical team decision or or Carvajal felt he could play, but I, it was just bad all around. It's bad look because it was the same injury. It's the, it's a bad look. It's uh, 16 games so far missed this season. I think, uh, well, you missed 74 games so far since 2014-15 season. 18 injuries, 14 muscle injuries of those 18. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's injury number 40 for Madrid so far this season. Insane. So quite something, quite yeah. something. All right, listen, man, one, one more thing, because mm. uh, I wanted to talk about this uh, while we were discussing Barca, but no te has mojado. You didn't uh, wet yourself, as they say <laughs> okay. in Spanish. Uh, Neymar is in there. Messi, of course, is. Uh, Mbappé will be there. But uh, what do you see happen tomorrow, my friend? Uh, I think... I think Barcelona will have a narrow victory mm-hmm. or it's going to be a draw. Okay. So a 2 1 or a 2 all, something like that? Yeah, something like that. Or yeah. 1 0. God damn, I hope PSG doesn't score two goals in a come. No, man. That would not be good. Yeah. And I think the, I, it's the, part of the reason I have trouble predicting this one is that because I haven't really watched much, much of PSG this season to really know mm-hmm. how they're doing. Mm-hmm. And not having Neymar obviously sucks. It's not ideal. But um, I just, I don't know, just a hunch that I think Barca will tie this game or slightly win, or slightly or a slight victory. Mm. And then PSG will will ramp it up in Paris and win it, win it there. That's my mm. that's my gut feeling. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How about you? How are you feeling? Do you, Di Maria's uh, out? That's oh. A, Di Maria also out. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. He always performs against Barcelona. So what's your, what's your feeling? Do you dare to uh, predict anything? Uh, that's a likely scenario that could play itself out, the one that you just uh, outlined. Uh, it's not the one I'm hoping for, naturally, but um, I am cautious. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic for this first leg, uh, seeing, as it, seeing as it's in the Camp Nou. Um, of course, the fan factor is a, a no factor. I don't know if that plays against or, or in favor of the teams at the moment, whether you play your first game at home and the second one away, etc. Uh, it's going to be tough. You know, my French friends keep telling me that PS, PSG suck, that they're shit, and that Barca will win easily. Um, they're all from Marseille, I should also say, so <laughs> I don't know if I can trust them. And they probably, um, and they probably, um, they probably don't watch Barca that much either. That's possible. Yeah, maybe, 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 maybe. <laughs> So, look, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for a Barca win tomorrow. And then seeing as the second leg is uh, like a month away, it's crazy. But uh, a good three weeks, uh, uh, we're going to have to wait for round two. I'm going to wait for that one. But uh, I think we're going to win tomorrow. Okay. Big words. Yeah. Big words, Diego Lorin. Good luck, my friend. Um, you, so we have a fun Churros y Tática sign up on Friday then because we have Sevilla, Dortmund, plus Barca, PSG to talk about. And we'll see we'll see what the, the mood will be. And we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. So to get access to that podcast, go over to patreon.com slash churros y tacticas. It's only there. If you like what we do, please consider supporting us. Um, it's actually cheaper than churro to, to get access to our to our churros. And our churros are much better, they're much longer, they're much thicker, and they're much juicier. <laughs> So, just better bang for your buck all around. Yeah. We're, we're, st- we're, we're still talking about churros, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so, go over to patreon.com slash churros y tacticas and get awesome bonus content. Every Friday, you'll get a show. And Diego Lorin, this was fun. We'll chat Friday. Take care, my friend. That's good, too. You, too. Peace, peace.